live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. Stocks losing some steam heading into the close. The Dow still holding on to gains, but the S&P 500 and NASDAQ are racing their advances in the last hour. We're tracking the market action for the final hour of trading. And the big mover to watch today, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency topping $50,000, its highest level since 2021. We've got expert analysis on what's driving the action and how the money is moving into spot Bitcoin ETFs. And it is a merger Monday on Wall Street, the deal of the day in the energy space with Diamondback acquiring Endeavor for nearly $26 billion. We'll get analyst reaction to the news and a look at why the uptick in merger activity is not slowing down. Let's get you up to speed on the market action, which has definitely changed here as the day has gone on. As we just talked about with the S&P and the NASDAQ slipping into the red here and those declines sort of accelerating, even as the Dow hangs on to its gains. But take a look at that intraday action here and you see that slip downward for the three major averages. Right now, uh, we are seeing energy stocks hang on to gains in the S&P, even as tech is the drag. And speaking of tech, something we've been monitoring today is sort of the market cap race between NVIDIA and Amazon. Even though the stocks are, even though NVIDIA is down, guess what? Amazon is down too. And so NVIDIA's market cap is still just edging out that of Amazon, so surpassing uh, that other stock. Interesting that we've been watching that, but it seems as though the declines that we've been watching today have coincided with um, the sort of rollover in some of the AI stocks that have been so, so hot. Yeah, so you're, you're talking stocks. You know what else we can talk about? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Crypto today. Why don't we start there? Because we have some headlines, Julie Hyman. Uh, Bitcoin jumping to 50000 for the first time in more than two years. We all remember, of course, 2022 and that nasty plunge. Lots of questions at that point, Julie, about the asset, the future of the asset. You had crypto fans on TV seeming kind of dazed and confused. But now Bitcoin mm -hmm. has been on the move. It has tripled since the start of last year. Of course, you know, listen, it's still well below that all-time mm -hmm. high, which is around 69,000. But rallying back here in part, of course, due to, you know, something we've talked a lot about, which is, these approval of these new spot Bitcoin ETFs and the bet some are making that, yes, these new products over time are going to drive greater mainstream adoption. And initially, of course, after we finally got the approval and the beginning of trading for those ETFs, we saw a little bit of a pullback in Bitcoin, which some who watched the industry closely had predicted would happen, a sort of sell the news event. Now, Coindesk, the publication that follows crypto very closely, says we're back at the FOMO stage mm. of Bitcoin here, uh, pointing out, uh, as you did, that we saw that peak of 69,000, but then the low at the end of 2022 was 16. So obviously, we've come back quite a bit. Uh, from that level. And last year was kind of a, a slow rally, if you will. There's one um, analyst out there that, again, Coindesk is quoting today from CryptoQuant, that we could see Bitcoin uh, touch $112,000 this year. And they're looking specifically at the inflows into those spot Bitcoin funds. Yeah. And if that momentum continues, that's at least the implication of that one forecast. Yeah, and also, not to get too geeky, but people are also talking about that so-called Bitcoin halving. Yes. which you expect in April, which sort of refers to this process of um, curbing the supply of new tokens. So some expect, hey, as we get closer to that, is that another catalyst? Does chatter start bringing, bringing that up as well? Right. When we look at the spot Bitcoin ETFs in terms of the net inflows into those, according to Bloomberg Intelligence data, $2.8 billion is what we're talking about. And that's even with some pretty big outflows of more than $6 billion from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. That's because... Again, not to get too wonky here, Do but it. basically wonky. before these were approved, many people held that GBTC. Then when the others got approved, they moved their money over because we saw the discount collapse between GBTC and the underlying price of Bitcoin. So we saw some funds move their money to some of the other spot Bitcoin ETFs. All of that said, again, still net inflows 
into those uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs. Yeah, and it was interesting because the reports I saw too said that maybe the, you were seeing some indication that the outflows um, from the Grayscale, Grayscale Fund could be maybe losing some steam here as well. So that was part of it too. Yeah, so we'll see what happens next. And we're going to talk about Bitcoin a little bit more a little bit later Excellent. in the show. But for now, let's get back to stocks. The S&P 500 holding on to the 5,000 level after closing above that milestone for the first time on Friday. But this week brings the first key inflation data of 2024. It's likely to test the latest rally. For more on what to expect moving forward, let's welcome in Matt Kuschlansky, Gen Trust Principal. Hey, Matt, good to see you. So we have obviously seen a big migration in the estimates for how many rate cuts we're going to get this year. And what's been interesting is that even with that change, stocks have continued to rally. Do we get confirmation uh, still of all of this from the CPI tomorrow? Well, first of all, thanks for having me back. Um, I think there's a lot of information that's that's already come to us, um, and things are really coming into view. I think for 2024, uh, pretty quickly, we're, we're pretty far along now in earnings season, um, with more than 60 percent of the S and P having reported and representing probably more than 75 percent of the market cap. Um, and at this point, we believe with what's priced into to the S and P. Uh, that market participants are giving us a pretty strong sense of the world they expect to inhabit um, by the end of 2024. Um, and I have to say, it, based on what it looks like, that, that looks like a pretty spectacular place to be. Um, they expect to see earnings growth of between 10 and 11 percent. They expect six rate cuts, uh, and they expect inflation to have come all the way down to 2 percent and really anchored there. Um, and so it's it's pretty beautiful at the other end of the rainbow. I think, unfortunately, uh, there's a big mountain uh, of economic data, uh, inflation data that you just alluded to, um, geopolitical risk, a noisy election year here in the U.S., and a lot of Fed decisions um, between here and there. Um, and, and so instead of pricing the market to kind of go slowly and carefully around that mountain, uh, we bid prices up and multiples up, particularly for the S&P, uh, to go straight up the mountain and directly across it. Um, and I think the market is, is somewhat discounting how treacherous a path that is. Uh, we need disinflation to continue across 2024 to get down at least below 2.5% in order to give the Fed uh, the room to start making those cuts. Uh, but we can't really see it go too far down below 2% for fear of cutting into the aforementioned growth that's priced in for, for earnings for the rest of the year. And similarly with the rate cuts, I think we want to see some amount of rate cuts to justify the multiples, which we are, to see the cost of capital start to come down. But too many rate cuts, uh, once we get going on that path, too many rate cuts portend a world where the Fed is worried about growth and starting to artificially prop us up. Um, and so the market is kind of signaling that they believe in what I'm going to call the immaculate correction uh, of rates levels and uh, inflation levels without any impact on growth. And to the extent we do actually experience that, I think they're going to really reward uh, equities. And I think they're going to push prices up, even if that means pushing multiples up further from here. We're already at 20 times forward earning on the S&P versus what the rest of the world is probably close to about 13 uh, on average. And I think we'll even see the multiples push higher if we do achieve that, what I call immaculate correction. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of ways for us to be disappointed um, along that path. And so Matt, g given that outlook, you know, you, you obviously see plenty of, of reasons for maybe for caution here, some red flags. Given that outlook, Matt, when you look at the U.S. stock, but where, where do you see value right here in terms of sectors? We tend to be more, you know, purely uh, tethered to the index. I think within uh, within the, the various sectors, obviously technology is the one everybody's been watching and it seems pretty bit up. But again, that's where all the growth um, is, is expected. Um, I think more broadly, we're, we're looking at U.S. small and U.S. large cap and see, sorry, U.S. small and US mid cap, excuse me, and seeing a little bit more uh, value there versus uh, the rest of the U.S. large cap. But again, the game is in the growth and the growth is really priced at the top of the market right now. And what do you think all of what you were talking about with the Fed implies for yields? And then how does that feed back to stocks? I think with the Fed, one of the things that we're really focused on at GenTrust is the assumption of six cuts that's priced into the market by the end of the year. Um, it kind of reminds me of that 49ers 
field goal just after the two-minute warning, the 52-yard field goal. Uh, they lined up to kick it. It's probably a 50-50 kick, so the expected value of the kick is probably one and a half points. The thing is, you're either going to get zero or three. You're never going to get one and a half. I think there's an analogy there for the price cuts that are the number of cuts that are priced into the market. I should say, um, I think there's definitely a, a path where we're disappointed with inflation data, and the Fed doesn't have room to maneuver, and we have somewhere between zero and two cuts. That's definitely a camp. There's a there's a camp that believes we'll still see that recession that everybody wants to avoid. Um, and in that case, you're going to see something like 12 to 16 cuts. And if you take those two probabilities and you weight them and you average them, maybe you get to six cuts. It doesn't mean you're going to get those six. Um, it just means that that's kind of the average path. Uh, and, and, and in some funny ways, two negative outcomes averaged together uh, create a pretty favorable outcome for equities. And, and I think that's where the market is, is, is priced today, and that's what they're expecting. For somebody who's an asset allocator, uh, as we are, um, and is concerned about how they want to weight fixed income versus equities. Our, our view is that fixed income is the safer play um, on balance between, uh, between that and equities, given that if we see rates flat or even come up from here, you're not going to be too fussed on how quickly you'll earn out of that because you're already getting paid a pretty high rate of return on fixed income. Um, whereas if we're disappointed on the bottom side, when we get a lot of cuts, um, you're going to be pretty punished uh, as an equity investor in all likelihood uh, based on that recession that we've been we're priced to fade. So we think you're much more neutral um, sitting in fixed income today versus in equities given the various paths that we see as possible. And Matt, one, one last issue I want to get your take on before we let you go is, is commercial real estate, Matt. You know, you look at these headlines from NYCB. Um, when you look at that, Matt, do you get concerned about what that means for the banking system and, and the economy? Or are you in the camp, Matt, that you think, you know what, no. You know, you look at you look at that bank and think its problems are its own, it's idiosyncratic. I think that bank is idiosyncratic, though I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on that one. Um, but more broadly, I think that's that's a timing issue. I think where, the, where we're expecting this, um, where the market's expecting some amount of easing and some amount of relief would give banks a longer time to manage those, some, some of those more challenging commercial real estate loans that they have on their books. Um, and the quicker and more painful that that process has to be resolved, uh, the more difficult it's going to be for the market to, to, to continue to kind of brush it under the rug. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. As always, appreciate the time and insight. Thanks for having me. Engaged Capital reportedly gaining support from the founding family of VF Corp. That's corner Reuters. The activist investor looking to make changes to VF Corp board shares the company jumping in today's trade. You can see they're up about 13%, Julie. So the activist investor Engaged Capital apparently has the backing of the founding family of VF Corp um, in its push for board seats. This is according to Reuters reporting. The descendants of the founding family, Julie, apparently hold about 15% of the company. Engage controls about, it looks like a 1% stake. And Engage has already apparently identified, it looks like three people with what they say is retail sector turnaround expertise to serve as kind of director candidates on this one. Yeah, it's unclear to me if if they, he has the buy-in of the whole family or just one representative of the family, Kelly Barbie, who Reuters spoke to and is citing here. So that's a little bit still mm -hmm. kind of in play. But regardless, uh, Bracken Darrell, who's the relatively new CEO of VF Corp, has already been making some of the changes. Um, even after the company's earnings missed estimates last week, they said they were going to evaluate um, potential options for their PAX business, that is backpacks, mm -hmm. Kipling, Jansport are the well-known uh, names in there. Um, and also uh, an interesting headline that caught my eye is that Daryl has been buying shares. He recently, in a filing, was re revealed he bought a million dollars worth of shares of VF Corp. So trying to show his confidence in right. the path that the company is Skin on. Skin in the game. He has exactly. been aware. I mean, you're right. He has, he has this you know, turnaround plan in place with cost cutting and layoffs. But, you know, you look at that stock and yes, it's up today, but it has been shelled over yes. the past 12 months for yes, sure. Yes, it has. Um, here's another stock that is really moving big today, yeah. like in a very exaggerated fashion. We're talking about Arm Holdings. Those shares are up 26 percent, uh, extending gains in the aftermath of last week's big earnings report. And by the way, the shares rose as much as 42% in today's session. And overall, the shares are up around 50% following those quarterly numbers last week. What strikes me here is, yes, the numbers were good. Yes, the forecast was good. But when I compare its forecast 
to the forecast from NVIDIA mm -hmm. last spring that really reset the whole conversation on AI, the magnitude is not the same. ARM came out and said its revenue will be at least $850 million. The average analyst estimate was $778 million. When NVIDIA came out last spring and reset expectations, it, it was like b billions. Uh, there was the gap between expectations and what mm -hmm. NVIDIA said. That said, it seems like there is such a desire, maybe even a desperation, on the part of investors to get in on the next big thing in AI that they just seem to be pouring into ARM. Yeah, remember we did talk though, we had that great chat with uh, tech analyst Patrick Moorhead yes. when we saw these moves and he told us like, I, I think his exact words were something, it doesn't get much better than this. Kind of anyway, he was talking about, not just the report, but as he told us, the market was growing, market share gains, expanding the footprint in PCs. And, and yes, when I think you asked him, Julie, you know, you asked him, is this a smart play for our viewers? If they're thinking, if you're a long-term investor and you're looking for those smart AI plays to play that big long trend, you know, Patrick Moore says yes, he would put ARM in that camp. What, I wonder if we asked him that question again, again today after this continued move upward from a price perspective, from a valuation perspective, if his answer would be the same. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, his point was, listen, in, in when we talk about AI, you still, we live in this world now, you still need the GPU, which is NVIDIA, yes. but his point was you still knew, you know, you need the CPU and that's arms world. Right, well, right. and speaking of the GPU, as we mentioned before, NVIDIA, which had been rallying today, now has turned lower. Yeah. But we've been watching its market cap climb. It's now near $1.8 trillion. And last time I checked, was still slightly larger than that of Amazon, which was the next it's largest remarkable. company. It is, it remarkable. is remarkable, the move yeah. that we have seen. I mean, it's not like Amazon's been a slouch, right? No. It's just that NVIDIA's gains have been so dramatic. You see there on that chart that its market cap has climbed 230% in the last 12 months, and still 90% of analysts say you should buy it. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Right. Well, we talked to Stacey Rouskin recently. He said it's cheap. He said, he said if yeah. you, because the E of the PE keeps rising yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Finally, here, let's check out Wall Street's mood souring on EV makers as pressure builds amid broader EV slowdown. Shares of Rivian, Tesla sliding. Barclays points to demand softness, implying a pricing risk for Rivian. So, this was an interesting note, Julian Rivian. So, um, the team at Barclays. You know, it's certainly worth pointing out, they cut Rivian to equal weight, so equivalent of a hold there. And analysts were interesting because they said, actually, they told their clients, the company's vehicles are great. It's the word they used. They like them. Mm -hmm. But what they see is just demand soft as being ish an issue, implies risk, the analyst told his clients, or pricing, slower volume growth, and longer path to break even, his price target, 16. And there are also continued reports about Tesla cutting prices of its vehicle, of its uh, Model Y uh, rear, wheel, rear wheel drive, but at the same time, prices could go up by $1,000 or more on March 1st. But that headline about the cutting, I mean, as we've talked about with multiple analysts, from a fundamental perspective, one of the near to mid moderate term concerns is the margins at Tesla. Yeah. And so if it's gonna keep cutting prices, that's not great news for the margins. So, you know, it's sort of a combination of, um, you know, speculation around the name and some fundamental concerns that have been hitting the stock. Yeah, he's cut, I mean, listen, he, Musk has been clear, he's willing to cut prices and play, he wants to play the volume game because you're trying to just spur demand in a market where EV sales, we, as we've been talking about, are just slowing. They're right. not where they were. And then the interesting question is, how do you try to re-accelerate growth? First of all, can you even get back to the growth that you once had? And if you do, what, what is the challenge there? Is it really just a pricing issue? Well, right. and he would say, of course, that part of the investable case for Tesla is AI and full self-driving. And on that latter point, just briefly, um, in some markets and on yeah. some um, distribution channels like YouTube, during the Super Bowl, there was someone who has been a very vocal critic of Tesla, Dan O'Dowd, whose organization ran um, ads questioning the safety of full self-driving. Mm -hmm. Whether that's any playing into at all what's going on with stock today, who knows? But that's just something else, again, that's on more the speculative Yeah, it got side. attention in headlines, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. All yeah. right, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Diamondback Energy is agreed by Endeavor in a deal valued at $26 billion. We're going to break down the deal on what it means for the M&A space and for energy going forward. Plus, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to get analyst insight to break down two stocks and help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned.
Big tech stocks have seen major gains this year, propelling the S&P 500 to numerous record closes. But how are other indices affected amid bullish options trading activity on big tech? Let's get it over to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, keeping up the options conversation. I love it, Jared. Yes, it's still options week. I, it's I always feel options it. week. I feel it. Um, <laughs> let's start with the NASDAQ today. This is really interesting. I'm going to get into how all of this weaves in in a second. But let's take a look at the broader market action. Uh, we we did have an attempted test of its high, and this is just today, and then we sold off fairly hard. And I was looking for a catalyst for these two down legs, and really the only thing I was able to find was NVIDIA. It seems like NVIDIA and the, uh, and the whole AI trade is seeing a little bit of uh, shade cast on X.com, if you can believe that. But here's what was happening in NVIDIA today. Those two down legs that I was highlighting before, those coincided with here, and these are much greater percentage moves in NVIDIA. Uh, this is a stock that's accounting for one quarter, 25% of all the gains in the S&P 500 this year. And then there's all the talk and all the attention surrounding uh, the market cap, and I can go through that as well. But bottom line, it looks like the AI trade uh, may be faltering a little bit. Are we going to short NVIDIA? I would say probably not the best idea. But if you were going to take profits, now would look like a pretty interesting time to do that. Uh, here is market cap. And we're seeing NVIDIA now greater than Amazon, Julie. So that is holding. It was down here earlier today. Amazon started out the day a little bit higher. In fact, NVIDIA moved ahead of Alphabet at one point. Uh, but we can see it's uh, back up to its top slot right there. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight, and this ties in, this goes back to the beginning about all this call buying activity. This is a, a chart of the NASDAQ 100 going back to beginning at GameStop 2021. That was when we saw all this options buying, call buying specifically, really affect the greater stock uh, universe. And in purple here, we have these spikes when calls are really in favor here. Those tend to coincide with downdrafts in the NASDAQ 100. So here we have this minor one. And these are only about two weeks uh, long. So we're not talking about a, uh, a longer reversal here. But nevertheless, we have seen some pretty uh, historical good examples of when call buying gets extreme. The next two weeks are a little bit weak. And that's kind of where we are right now. It doesn't have to happen, but just another reason why you might want to raise those stops on the AI trade. All right, Jerry Blickery, thank you, my friend. We move on. It is the deal of the day on Wall Street. Diamondback Energy merging with Endeavor Energy Resources. That deal valued at nearly $26 billion. The shares of Diamondback are jumping on that news. It's the latest and, of course, a string of M&A activity in the energy sector. Joining us now is David Deckelbaum, T.D. Cowan, senior analyst. David, it is great to have you on the show, and you are just the man Thanks to talk to about this headline, David. So listen, first of all, just get your general take, David. You've had time to look at, at, the, at this news. Does it make sense to you, David, kind of financially and strategically? Uh, certainly investors, they, they like it, David. I look at Diamondback Energy, you know, it's up here about 9% in today's trade. Yeah, yeah no, that's a great point. Uh, and thanks for having me. Yeah, Diamondback's up 9% today. Obviously, investors like it. But if you were looking for a perfect deal, you know, this is really it. Uh, just sort of at a, at a very high level, right? You're checking all of the boxes. They're increasing their production by almost 70%. They're increasing the number of locations by over 60%, the wells that they can drill over time. And this is a company that's right in their backyard. So there, there's so many logical synergies there, but you're practically buying the same sort of acreage that you have now. So you really have no degradation performance. Valuation was very reasonable. And now you've just really scaled to now be the third largest producer in the Permian Basin. David, it has been just crazy, the amount of deals and the size yeah. of the deals that we've been seeing for New Shale, um, or not New Shale, but to, to buy new to these companies, Shale. There's the list of the deals. Um, again, on a high level, what is driving this sudden surge of activity? Yeah, I, I mean, I really think... There, there's probably two big things. One is that the market becomes fast followers, generally speaking, right? I think once the music starts, you start worrying about the music stopping and not having a chair to sit down on. But I think this really gets back to beginning in 2018, all of this energy complex was pushed by investors to start returning capital to shareholders, which means no one's growing production anymore. Everyone's just kind of cutting costs, reducing capital spending, and then giving that excess free cash back to shareholders 
uh, you know, in the first several years, we saw massive outperformance in the energy index uh, right in 2022, 2023, it underperformed. And I think a lot of this now gets to the point of, uh, if you've already initiated, initiated this huge sort of dividend and variable buyback and variable dividends program, this return of capital program, without growth, how do you create value? You create value through M&A. And so David, as you look you know, ahead here and, and maybe potential M&A activity coming in the pipeline, before getting to possible targets, David, I'm also curious who you think you know, the potential acquirers are. Because uh, I look at some of the names, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, know, you can look like an Exxon or a Chevron, David. I, I would think those folks would probably be sitting on the sidelines now, given kind of the deals they've already committed to. So who do you think would be a potential acquirers in the quarters ahead? Yeah, I mean, look, you certainly have you have some names out there that that uh, have a business model that that you know sort of goes against uh, making large scale acquisitions like this. I, EOG has every always done things more or less organically speaking. Now, ConocoPhillips is one that hasn't done a large deal in a while. I'm sure that that ConocoPhillips is one at top of mind for folks of, of just a name in the space that could conceptually uh, look for some bolt on deals here. To your point, Exxon and Chevron are probably going to be on the sidelines, I'd imagine, digesting obviously Pioneer and Hess, uh, respectively. Uh, you have a few others out there, sort of an independent land. You know, Devon Energy has certainly been, I think, mentioned as one that's been looking at deals. Um, you know, Coterra is, is one that said in the past that they look at, at many acquisitions. Uh, and then you have some other smaller cap names as you get into to companies like Ford, I think that look for consolidation opportunities in other areas like the Bakken. But, right, I mean, you've seen so many names in the Permian kind of coming off the board here. There, there aren't that many other places to look as to, to what's obvious in terms of what's next. Well, David, so how do you play it then as an investor? Do you look to some of these larger players as they digest these big deals? Is that indeed going to be successful? in adding value for shareholders, or do you try to game out the stuff that hasn't consolidated yet? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And honestly, in many cases, we advise clients to just leave M&A uh, out, out of their thesis because we aren't seeing you know, premiums in terms of takeouts for public names. Even if you look at the case of you know, Pioneer, you look at the case of Hess, you know, premiums for takeouts were very minimal in those cases, you know, and these were, were effectively all equity deals. You know, you look at Diamondback, they're buying a private company, 70% equity deal. I think that we try to tell folks, you know, look for names that actually have the license to go out and acquire and have done a good job doing that in the past. And that's why Diamondback has been one of our top picks for the last couple of years, is this management team has a history of extracting a ton of value uh, through through acquisition. And I think this Endeavor deal just kind of follows up to, to what they've been doing in the past. But I think as you look forward, you have to look at names that really have superior inventory life that don't need to be out there in the market necessarily looking for something and have this visible runway of returning capital to shareholders. Hey, David, one last question. I want to get you out of here on this. I'm, I'm Diamondback and Endeavor. Uh, David, sure. I'm interested. How do you think regulators respond to that, David? Do you foresee any kind of issues there? I, I would imagine it goes a normal course of business. Um, you know, we get asked this question a lot, but I think, you know, independent oil and gas companies, they don't control the market. You know, even though they'll be the third largest producer in the Permian Basin, one, I think if you're not going to have scrutiny around Exxon and Pioneer, that kind of gives you a decent uh, insight into to the lack of scrutiny around this deal. Uh, this company will not control the marketplace in the Permian. They're not going to be impacting gasoline prices at the pump. I'm sure it'll go through the normal review, but I wouldn't expect a whole lot of antitrust pressure against this deal. David, it was so great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. And coming up, the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're gonna get analyst insight, to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned, more Yahoo Finance after this.
it's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. And today we're taking a look at European airline stocks as consumers continue to spend on travel, which stock is worth keeping grounded and which can take your portfolio to new heights. I'm here with Abe Deshpande, Centerstone Investors founder and chief investment officer. Thanks so much for being here. Great to be here. Thanks. So let's start with the big Irish airline Ryanair, which also trades here in the U.S. It's done pretty well over the last year, in particular over the last several months. But let's talk about your case here for why it's going to be a winner. It's a low-cost airline, first of all. It's a low-cost airline. And so in a commodity business like airlines, like any commodity business, it's all about cost. Um, it's about cost uh, being the lowest in the, in, in the industry, and that tends to be the winner. And that You can you apply that to pretty much any commodity industry. That is the entire basis of uh, their operating model, uh, down to the fact that they only operate the 737 airplane. So they don't have, like most mm-hmm. other airliners, a suite of airline uh, air, air, airframes. They have one airframe. Uh, with that focus on cost, what they've been able to do is provide the lowest price to the consumer. It's also allowed them to narrow down in a world where, in an industry where many things are out of your control, they've narrowed it down to a couple: uh, fuel and demand. So demand can go up and down, as you know, with the recession. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having the low-cost low operator down there, when demand falls, they tend to be able to actually gain market share because they can price at a level, level much lower than anybody else. Right. What demand is there, they gain that market share. All of this means that they also have a strong balance sheet because of some of the operating levers that you talked about, including keeping their fleet pretty narrowly focused. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, in, if you're, you know, I'm not pitching all airlines. That's a terrible industry. If you're, <laughs> from, my, from my perspective, if you're going to invest in airlines, you, it's, it, it's best to treat it like a commodity business, which means uh, pick the lowest price player. Also focus on balance sheets because you do have, uh, I mean, in, during COVID, demand went to essentially zero. You need to be able to uh, withstand kind of extreme uh, environments that also happened uh, post-COVID uh, or uh, post-global uh, financial crisis. So balance sheet is the second most important thing. Cost structure, number one. Number two is balance sheet. Number three is management, which we'll, we may get to. But yes. the, the balance sheet is extremely important. Here where they've excelled is they have not gone into you know, fancy uh, financial engineering in order to build the business. It's organic growth. They generate cash flow. They buy an airplane. Mm-hmm. They generate cash flow from that airplane. They buy another airplane. So it's only airplanes that they can afford effectively. Yeah, it's 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 organic growth. So gotcha. they're not borrowing a lot of money. They're not going to lease uh, into the lease model. Mm-hmm. They own most, uh, if not, I mean, the vast majority of the airplanes. They may lease five percent or something like that. Um, but that that's a very different. Um, you know, financial model than most most other airlines, uh, including, by the way, Lufthansa is also an owner, not so much a lesser. All right, but don't jump us. We're going to get to that there. in a minute. So let's let's talk about the high quality management team as well, which right. you alluded to. Probably the most important thing a management can t- team can do. Uh, outside of managing the business is manage the capital of the business. Now, we lo- also like to point out potential risks, even for a good buy, right? And in this case, you've kind of alluded to it a couple times, which is that airlines are not tr- usually a strong, a great business, right? They tend to, you know, expand capacity by too much, for example, or, you know, they buy too many planes, what- whatever it-, it may be. So I guess there's always a risk that Ryanair could do something similar. Yeah, they could uh, easily expand beyond their capability to maintain the um, financial model together, right? Uh, they could, uh, I, I, I think, since they've got most of it under control, like a lot of the what could go wrong sort of scenarios tend to be things that they cannot control. You mentioned the economy, for instance. Regulation. Uh, what is happening in Europe next year? We don't even know what's happening next month, you know? So uh, the, the, the kind of... Um, you know, and they've grown substantially by adding services to the the periphery of of Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And you know, if that becomes a, a war zone, I don't know in the next couple of years, who knows? I'm not right. predicting that. But those types of things obviously have a much more um, 
uh, uh, much more of an impact on Ryanair. They're right. not a global player. They're really a regional player. So, so what happens in the region so is extremely important. So they're exposed to that region, yes. Most similarly. And you do own shares of Ryanair in your portfolio, yeah. is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Let's get then to quickly to your goodbye, the one you don't like, you hinted at it. It's Lufthansa, the German airline. Those shares have gone down over the past year. So let's get to it here. First of all, here to susceptibility to the economic cycle. But this is not a low-cost airline. So this is not a low-cost airline, although they have a low-cost segment. Mm -hmm. And this is, and I picked these two companies uh, on purpose. They're the only two companies I would buy because they're the only two of note um, other than some Asian airlines that actually own the fleet. Lufthansa gotcha. does as well. Uh, there's a, there are a few differences. Um, Lufthansa is built, originally was built as a, um, a long-haul carrier, meaning longer, you know, international routes. Mm -hmm. And they had some economic and sort of scale advantages built uh, at, with that model. Um, time has gone by, obviously, and more and more uh, of the of the air traffic is intra-Europe, and so that's where the low-cost model has really taken a shine. I mean, you're, you're like you mentioned earlier. I mean, some of these tickets are like twenty-five dollars or right. twenty-five euros one way, right? And meantime, they're losing market share to the likes of Ryanair. They're losing market share to the likes of Ryanair, and the likes likes of Ryanair, Ryanair is what Ryanair was there, the main main uh, sort of low cost competitors. They're losing some market share there, um, and you know the the valuations of the two businesses kind of uh, also make me want to favor one of the uh, one or right. the other, right? This one is trading for we'll call it six times operating profit. Ryanair is about eight times off, operating profit. Mm -hmm. But there should be a much, much wider gap. And Ryanair is a, a uh, trading at airline multiples, but it's a it's a more or less a franchise. Another contrast with Ryanair, the balance sheet here. There, it's got a more leveraged balance sheet, and therefore has exposure to higher interest rates. Yeah, um, you know, mid single billion uh, net debt. Now they they're you know they've gotten into trouble. They've had to encumber a lot of their uh, their uh, their fleet that they owned. Um, to secure some financing during COVID. They're exiting that. They're, they've spun off some uh, subsidiaries, like a catering business. So they're finding ways to generate some cash uh, or to free up the balance sheet. Um, it's not like a clear and present danger. They do have assets that offset the, the debt yeah, that's on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, uh, it's not something that's going to impair the business uh, or, or threaten their survival. Right. But as an equity owner, in a total uh, enterprise value uh, situation, I'm more concerned about how much value is being detracted by the debt. Right. Right. Now yes. we're talking about businesses that with with a large amount of debt. Yeah, it's. It's not, not as left, not, not as much left over for equity. Yeah, and then we also like to talk about what could go right here. Um, and this is a company that is at least supported by the German government, and so that could help them out. But but would that help the stock appreciate necessarily? So the number one thing that to get, that I think could go right is, and this is not, I don't think, even a revelation, right? But they've now shown, uh, I mean, granted, the gun pointed at their head, but they've shown the ability to create or try to unlock value for shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, a business that is, you know, essentially a government um, has, you know, it's, it's not government owned, but it, you know, highly government influenced with government put, basically. You know, there's always a question mark: uh, who is the, uh, who, 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 for whom is this business being run? Shareholders or the government or you know, the local municipality? And in this case, you know, you can see some. Uh, you know, some shareholder friendly moves um, that maybe mark the change uh, right. in, in mindset. But maybe and too early yet to get in on related to that. I wouldn't want to bet on yeah, that. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, interesting here because it's especially stocks we don't frequently talk about. So, Ave, thank you so much. You're telling investors just to sum up here to buy Ryanair for its low cost position, strong balance sheet, strong management team. On the other side, you say avoid Lufthansa. It's susceptible to the economic cycle. It's losing market share to companies like Ryanair. And it's exposed to higher interest rates because of its balance sheet. Abhay Deshpande, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And that'll do it for the latest installment of Goodbye or Goodbye. Look out for new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern.
It's been one month since the SEC's approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs. Since launching, funds have pulled in nearly $3 billion in inflows. It's according to coin shares. Today, Bitcoin prices briefly topped $50,000, boosted in part by spot Bitcoin ETF inflows. Joining us now for the latest pulse on all things crypto is Dante Cook, Swan Bitcoin head of Swan Business, along with Sean Farrell, Fundstrat Global Advisors, head of digital asset strategy. Guys, welcome both of you to the program. And Sean, maybe I'll start with you. You know, it, it has been, Sean, about a month since the SEC did approve these new spot Bitcoin ETFs. What have we, what have we learned so far, Sean? Granted early days, but what have we learned so far about demand for these new products? <clears throat> Well, um, you know, we have learned that, um, you know, bringing BlackRock into the equation is significant. We've learned that there is demand uh, for these products. Um, and we've also learned that people, you know, generally like low cost uh, liquid products over, you know, other products that might be more expensive and not, uh, you know, track the underlying asset as effectively. Um, Dante, is this indeed the reason that we have seen Bitcoin rallying like it has been, or are there other factors going on that people should know about? Well, there are a lot of other factors um, outside of just the ETF inflows, although that is a massive reason why uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of this price action, you know, because these ETF uh, launches have been historic, right? There have been over 5,000 ETFs launched over the last 30 years. You know, FBTC, Fidelity's product, IBIT, BlackShare's product are number one and number two of the most successful ETF launches of all time. And so, you know, just like the Chiefs uh, and Patrick Mahomes won back-to-back -back championships, I mean, these last two weeks, you've seen back-to-back -back historic levels of inflows um, and dollars moving into this asset class. And when you attach that to things like the Bitcoin halving, where the supply of overall Bitcoin will get cut in half uh, right around April, I mean, you're seeing a massive inflow of demand, um, institutional and retail, uh, hitting a, a, a supply shock. So I think there's a lot of different factors there. And Sean, I'm curious, um, you know, Bitcoin jumping to 50,000, first time in more than two years, Sean, where do you think the price heads from here, at least in the kind of near to intermediate term? What are the puts and takes we need to consider? Yeah, look, so we, we start our, you know, our, our analysis is based, uh, you know, we always start with macro, right? And um, we saw some potential turbulence heading into the year, you know, thought we were heading higher. Our price target for the year was 125, uh, certainly not in a straight line. But uh, a lot of that turbulence, uh, in our view, was going to stem from a repricing of the timing uh, and frequency of any potential Fed rate cuts, um, as well as potential upper pressure on the long end of the curve due to um, any potential increased coupon issuance from the Treasury. Um, and if we look at what has happened over the past several weeks, uh, you know, from right before the ETF launch up through today, uh, you know, we've kind of withstood a pretty uh, constant barrage of negative macro variables, right? We've had a pretty uh, massive rally in the dollar uh, you know, we've priced out most of the excessive rate cuts that I just mentioned, that I just alluded to. Um, and we also had some movement, upwards movement uh, at the long end of the curve. And so all that considered, you know, it's it's pretty, it, it paints a pretty constructive picture that, you know, having just gone through that, being at 50,000, uh, you know, that gives me some confidence that this rally, you know, in the near term certainly has some room to run. And Dante, that said, you know, we've seen that happen with other risk assets too, right? In other words, stocks have also been rallying in the in the face of some um, challenges here. And so I'm curious going forward, what are the biggest risks that you see to the continued rally in Bitcoin and, and crypto more broadly? Well, I think the big risks, I mean, like Sean mentioned, are, are really macro things. But when you take a step back and you look at Bitcoin in general, I mean, it has commodity properties in that it has a finite supply. Um, it's it's not controlled by any one party, uh, yet it has this high beta aspect to it that it rallies when you have liquidity enter the market. And so one of the things that we look at pretty closely and that Bitcoin's price closely tracks is global M2 liquidity, like into the market. And so if we have, you know, the Fed, which Jerome Powell on 60 Minutes uh, uh, last Sunday mentioned that they were going to have rate cuts this past year, um, and you talk about those things like Bitcoin is the fastest race in uh, the fastest horse in that race. And so if we have, you know, pretty quick and pretty severe 
you know, Fed rate cuts, interest rates go lower, we should expect to see Bitcoin's price go higher. But I mean, the macro, ma the macro backdrop, I mean, when you're when you step back and you look at things, you got mortgage delinquencies, uh, you know, skyrocketing, you have auto delinquencies skyrocketing, you have credit card debt reaching over a trillion, you have government fiscal debt reaching over a trillion in terms of interest payments, you have unemployment numbers, you know, quote unquote, being strong. But when you actually look at the data, you have a lot of uh, uh, jobless claims, you have a lot of part time workers, not really full time workers and jobs. And then the jobs that you do have are a lot of government workers related to snowstorms and things like that. And so when you look at the backdrop of the economy, right, things are not overall as strong as maybe the picture that's being painted. So Bitcoin, like other assets, like we're beholden to a macro market and environment. But as Bitcoin is beginning to show, especially with these ETF flows, like you're starting to see an element where Bitcoin decouples from other risk on assets because it's an entirely different asset class unto itself. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate your perspective on this. Dante and Sean, appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. The S&P 500 surging over 5,000 for the first time, largely due to significant increases in a few massive tech names. But our stock market gains set to broaden in 2024. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. We have heard this before. We've heard this question before. <laughs> yes. Are Everyone's they, been talking about it. Are they going right? to broaden? For, 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 do we, for do months, we know? right? Yeah. I, one thing, though, guys, that I, I did bring with us today is a little mm. bit more evidence that shows why we might broaden. Because I think that's one mm. thing that I know I've gotten into many conversations with strategists about, and I'm sure you guys have too, is okay, so we're going to broaden. Well, one of my first questions is always when are we going to see it in earnings? We have to see it in earnings at some point to sort of prove what we'd probably see in price reaction. And Bank of America was out with an interesting note today pointing out the difference in MAG7 earnings expectations versus the other 493 stocks in the S&P 500. And essentially pointing out, you can see here with your purple and blue lines, the purple line is the 493, the non-MAG7 stocks. The light blue line is the MAG7 stocks. You can see in Q4 right now, analyst projections are for the 493 to finally cross the MAG7 and have higher year-over-year -year earnings growth. Now, we could probably point to the fact that MAG7 is going to have tough comps at that point in Q4 and as far as year-over-year -year earnings growth goes. But we're seeing that gap really come closer together, guys. And I think that's the big takeaway here. And B of A sort of made the point that that might lead to some level of broadening or at least support that to see that. Because remember, we were looking at that one graph with big tech a couple weeks ago before yeah. earnings, and it was just a massive dispersion. So we're seeing that come away a little. Yeah, when you talk to strategists too, Josh, do they say, okay, well, if, if this rally is gonna continue, it has to broaden? It, it seems like that at some point, yeah. yes, right? At some point, strategists argue we would have to see more than basically at this point, you could argue it's four stocks driving us higher. But I think the main thing that most strategists are pointing out is it's probably not going to happen tomorrow and it might not even happen this month, Josh. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people are highlighting, Bank of America specifically highlighting June. A lot of people are talking that area of time because what do we think we're going to see in May or June? probably a little bit more certainty around the Fed, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, that's becoming the consensus call when we talk about broadening now is, we still think it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. but we need the Fed to get out of the way first, and then we might see that broadening happen. So a lot of mm -hmm. people do think if we're gonna go significantly higher than where we're at now with 5,000, maybe there is some sort of consolidation, we sell off a little bit, and then you move higher once we get the Fed out of the way, so to speak, and a better understanding where they're right. headed. Out of the way, that's what we're watching for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josh, appreciate yeah. it. Coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves, the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street on this Monday. So let's check on the markets, the close here, where we ended up. After the S&P 500, of course, closed above 5,000 for the first time, it's still closing above 5,000, but down on the day uh, by about a tenth of 1%, 5,000. 21, almost 5,022. The Nasdaq also lower on the day by about a third of 1%, but the Dow rising on the day about 127 points. That's about a third of 1%. In the absence of as many really big earnings reports today and awaiting CPI data tomorrow, not as much movement um, either on an index level or on an individual stock level today. By the way, my favorite note today. Tell Craig me. Johnson from Piper. Yes. The current state of the equity market can be summed up by the 1981 hit from 38 Special, <laughs> hold on loosely, but don't let go. Meaning he's not bearish on the market, but thinks we're ripe here for a correction, uh -huh. maybe five to 10%. Are you gonna say, are you gonna say? Maybe, maybe later, <laughs> off camera. Stocks ended the day off earlier highs with the Dow managing to close at a new record high. Jared Blickery is here with a look back at the day's action, Jared. Thank you, Josh. I was just checking in on some of the record closing highs for the day. NVIDIA is in there, and we're going to get to that stock in a second. Interesting because it's uh, well off of its highs, but it did manage a record close. So did the Dow, so did Walmart, and so did, for that matter, industrials. I haven't talked a lot about that, but industrials and home builders have been hitting record highs recently, and they notched another one today. So for sector action, utilities took the number one spot today. That's up about 1.2%, followed by energy, materials, staples, financials, communication services, but it was tech where we saw the most weakness, and we'll get to that in a second. Real estate also underperforming, and it looks like consumer discretionary also ended the day in the red. And in a day where we talked a lot about market cap and a lot of jockeying for position here, only NVIDIA and Meta of the mega caps managed to close in the green. And just a quick look at the closing market cap numbers here. NVIDIA had shot past Amazon and Amazon briefly today, but it ended up in the same place where it started the day this morning, at least physically in that location. Uh, let's move on from there. Enough talk about all of that because we want to get to some of our leaders leaders here. We had Bitcoin flying high today. Uh, Baito is my Bitcoin ETF. That's a proxy, but so is GPT GBTC. Each of those up more than 5%. Solar, that's been on fire recently. That has been trending higher. Uh, KWeb, that's the Chinese stocks, disruptions, real, excuse me, regional banks, retail, and IPOs. So a lot of different pockets of the market showing strength today. However, not tech. And let's look at the software sector first. ServiceNow is one of the outliers, down 3%, but just broad, broad weakness. Not a lot of dark red in here, just general weakness. And then when we take a look at the semiconductor, more green green than we did see in the uh, software sector. but And that's thanks to some outliers here like ARM. But nevertheless, a little bit of weakness in semiconductors as well. Uh, let me just show you this ARM chart here. I'm going to show you some candlesticks with a three-month chart. This is a stock that has doubled in the last few days. And this is just an incredible range expansion. Uh, it's almost behaving like a brand new stock that's just getting discovered by investors. Here's NVIDIA, uh, a little bit of a bearish candle, depends on where we close tomorrow, but for a stock that closed at a record high, I'm not going to say too much bearish. Okay, don't say too much bearish. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. The S&P 500 today closing slightly lower, but its performance year to date still far outpacing small caps. The Russell 2000s up less than 1% so far this year. Our next guest, though, does see a turnaround ahead. Joining us now, Eric Green, Penn Capital Management CIO. Hi, Eric. Good to see you. You have not been Hi. alone you? in your faith in small caps. That's been something we've mm -hmm. heard from a lot of investors. Um, and we sort of did see a rally in the waning months of 2023 that then kind of stalled out. What would reignite it? Uh, I think uh, the market is going to start to broaden out. Earnings should be helpful. This will be the first uh, first year um, in the last three where small cap stocks will have better earnings growth than large cap stocks. But also just the the one that when there's more confidence that the Fed is going to start cutting rates, uh, that should absolutely help small cap. Usually the credit market leads the equity market and credit spreads are near their lows or at their cycle lows right now. So the credit market is suggesting we can get a really nice rally in the small cap uh, in small cap equities. And so, so Eric, I think you just touched on a point I wanted to kind of double tap on there. How, how much of your thesis on small caps, Eric, is kind of really dependent here on the Fed and their rate strategy? 
Yeah, well, the Fed has already said that they're going to cut rates. So uh, in the short run, uh, the volatility in small caps, it'll, it'll be there based on whether the market thinks they're going to cut in May or in June or even further out than that. But at some point, the uh, small cap stocks are going to reflect the fact that we are on the other side of the rate increases and rates are going to start to come down. So it it the timing is, is certainly it's not there. We don't know for sure. But ultimately, you're going to start to see this broadening out. You're going to see investors move to small cap. I also think that M&A is going to be a big driver of small cap. You have uh, record low value valuations of small cap stocks relative to large cap stocks. So a large cap company buying a small cap company right now is very accretive, even at a premium. In addition to that, the cost to borrow continues to go down as interest rates have come down, uh, and as well as credit spreads have continued to go down. We are starting to see the beginning of an M&A boom. Uh, there's been a ton of pent-up demand in M&A for the last two years. We've been well, well below averages. Uh, it's still well below where we were pre-COVID. So we expect to see a lot of deals, and a lot of deals are going to come from larger companies buying smaller ones, from private equity firms buying very attractively valued small cap companies. Um, Eric, what's interesting, too, as you look out through the year and look at the outlook for the Fed, you don't necessarily think we're going to see a cut in May. How is that going to be a disappointment for the market if that's the case? I think the market is pretty much digested that there won't be a cut in May. Uh, you had a pretty big pullback on the Fed's comments. Um, unless we see a really uh, very, very low CPI, well, lower than expectations, I, I would say that the market will continue to expect the first cut to come in June rather than May. Uh, if we continue, if we see a uh, very low CPI number tomorrow or more confirming data that see that inflation is coming down faster than expectations, it's possible the market starts to put put back the May cut in there. But I, I don't think it'll be disappointing. I think right now the market is uh, preparing for no cut in May, a pause in May, and then a cut in June. And Eric, when, when we're talking small caps, are there certain verticals, sectors within small caps that you prefer? Sure. The, there's areas in the market that have actually performed fundamentally well, but their stocks have been lousy. As an example, consumer discretionary, uh, they've performed poorly the last couple of years because most investors assumed that we were going into a recession and nobody wants to buy a consumer stock when we go into an economic recession. Well, we clearly have not. The consumers held up much, much better than anybody expected. And the earnings have held up much better than expected. And given that the stocks have not moved, valuations have gotten extremely attractive. So we're looking at historically low valuation in some areas of the consumer, restaurant stocks, um, gaming stocks. Uh, you also see it in cruise and uh, other leisure areas, amusement parks are very inexpensive relative to where they've been historically and relative to the fact that, that we are not going off a cliff. The consumer is still very strong. They have jobs, they have confidence, and they believe inflation is coming down. That's what we're seeing. Um, I'm told, Eric, you also like energy stocks, and that's an yeah. interesting one to me yeah. because we just had yet another deal uh, announced today, uh, a shale deal um, yeah. uh, between uh, Diamondback and Endeavor. There's been a lot of consolidation there. Uh, what are you looking at as something that could help propel that group higher this year? Because it's been a, a little laggy. Sure. Uh, more broadening of the market, uh, more uh, value-oriented in investing, which value has gotten much cheaper than growth. So uh, and growth is always more expensive, but it's a much wider valuation gap than, than usual. So you need some money to pour into into value areas of the market, energy being one of them. You need stability in the oil price in this 75 to $85 range or 70 to $90 range, really. I think uh, like everybody who's expecting the next shoe to drop on the consumer, everyone expects that oil's gonna get crushed when we ultimately have some type of ceasefire either in, in the Ukraine or in the Middle East. And that will likely happen at some point. I don't expect the uh, oil prices to react negatively because supply demand uh, is in very good shape. Oil inventories around the world are well below historical range, the historical range, at least for the last five years. And demand is picking up certainly in uh, developed countries. And at some point, demand in China will come back very strong. Other areas like India, you're seeing demand uh, pick up considerably. And Eric, this is also an election year. I'm just curious, what are yeah. your clients asking you about that, Eric? And what are you telling them? 
Well, uh, since 1952, according to Strategist Research, uh, the market has not gone down in a year where an incumbent was running. And what typically happens is, uh, even though uh, a lot of stimulus plans need to go through Congress, there are also a lot of levers that can be pulled by, by the administration to make the general public feel better about the economy. So you can move, put forward some spending. Uh, there are other things uh, you can actually I try to pressure commodity prices to to get the consumer stronger. Uh, those are those are things that and there are other things that that the administration can do so that they can get their their side elected. And that's what typically happens. So I would just say that we're likely to be stronger over the next uh, over the next year. There is some seasonality. It gets a little bit weaker uh, in the second quarter and then starts to really pick up. Uh, into the election. And once the election is done, the uncertainty goes away, regardless of who the candidate, of whether which candidate wins. And then you get a very strong fourth quarter, historically. Right. Eric, thank you so much for joining the show today. I always appreciate it. Yep, thank you very much. Bye. And still to come on Yahoo Finance, which geopolitical issues could upend the economic recovery in the U.S.? We'll discuss on the other side and what you need to keep in your mind for your portfolio.
geopolitics back in the forefront for investors, including rising tensions in the Middle East, former President Donald Trump's latest comments to NATO, and the ongoing war in Ukraine, among other things. One question that's come up is whether some of these issues could indeed be a risk to the growing U.S. and really global economy. Joining us now for more on that and where will be the best place to put your money is Alexis Crow, PwC Principal and Geopolitical Investing Practice Global Head. So a very good person to talk to about the effects of all of this on the global economy. So what I'd like to do is kind of go thing by thing. Um, and I want to start with the U.S. election, because particularly for investors in Europe and uh, policymakers in Europe, they're concerned about the election. But even here in the U.S., there are a lot of questions around what each outcome could mean for our economic and trade policies. Sure, and thanks so much for having me back, Julie. Um, firstly, what I would say is it, it is a number one question that we're getting from executives regardless of where they're sitting, uh, regardless of the jurisdiction or the sector. Um, and really what happens after the November elections for the global economy and what happens for the investability of the US. And uh, certainly what I would say is there's a hyper focus on the two presumptive candidates there's less of questions which are, should be asked about what happens to the Hill, what happens to Congress and the capacity for follow through on policy reform. Will we have entrenched political gridlock to pass legislation or will we have greater cohesion? What happens to the Fed, which is politically independent in name, but there's a lot of questions as to what happens with the future governance of the Fed. So I, we also have to be careful about watching these other policy moves shake out. So what are the answers to all those questions, Alexis? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I would say is, regardless of how things shake out, uh, there, I think there are three key things that are impacting the investability of the United States. I repatriated from the UK 12 years ago for, for these three reasons. Um, one of them, and they're interrelated, one of them is immigration policy. Um, we've actually seen a significant tick up in immigration, and over the longer term, we have to look at the fact that population growth in the United States comes from immigration. Connected to that is innovation. We think about the United States being the second largest patent creator in the world after China, before Japan, um, and the extent to which immigration and positive policies can support innovation. And the third piece, which is interesting, is the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, um, also highlights the extent to which it, it, it really restructured our entire infrastructure P3 model, public-private partnerships, and has generated a lot of investor activity into, I would say, growth, sectors of growth for the future. And so those three things on the table, I would say, will outlast and endure whoever comes into the White House. One thing, Alexis, that's interesting is, despite we have all this geopolitical conflict, so it's Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, Red Sea, the market, though, seems to be taking it generally all kind of in stride. Does that surprise you? Well, this is why I would say that it's really monetary policy that moves markets not necessarily yeah. geopolitics. So we saw the, the, the popping up of geopolitics really come into the investor in the C-suite with regard to the Brexit referendum, so going back to 2016, then the Trump administration trade wars. Um, and you can see some market movements, but by and large, it's FOMC meeting minutes, it's Sintra and the ECB is really what's moving markets. Um, and so now are investors ignoring that at their peril? I would say that certainly what's going on in the Red Sea is highly um, underestimated uh, by market participants at the Why current Why do you moment. say that? Well, if you think about just the Straits of Hormuz and how integral these are to global energy markets, the extent to which exports from the GCC and liquid fuels and refined products like diesel are making up for supply that's missed from Russia, uh, for a lot of European importing countries, this is really, truly significant. Mm. Um, when are we going to start to see more of an impact? It seems like at least a lot of companies that we speak to have figured out either they're still getting through or they figured out other ways to get through. If you continue to see an escalation of attacks that may or may not encounter attacks that may or may not de be deemed to be effective, I think that's one way of looking at it. Um, another thing is if we think about just the price of oil at the current moment, we're currently in the nat gas season where everyone's using nat gas to be able to support electricity and heating. Uh, but when we move into the summer driving season in the United States and then you know, transport for fuel in Europe, I think you could look at a different scenario with regard to oil markets. Interesting. What do you think, Alexis? Let me get your take on uh, how you think or what you think Chinese officials, Chinese authorities make of our election here. What do you think they think about Trump and Biden? Do you think they have a preference? <clears throat> 
I would say if you think about the mindset in Beijing, there is certainly a capacity to think out over the longer term in a way that we really don't have in the United States. Uh, we're prone to electoral cycles, and really, if you start campaign financing two years into the four-year cycle, uh, we think in very different you know, ways of looking at the world. So I would say that probably the Chinese government's going to be patient no matter who comes into the White right. House. I would also say that <clears throat> it's very clear that both sides of the fence in the United States, both sides of the political aisle, are deeply antagonistic toward China. It's honestly the one thing that they seem to agree on. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So as you look across the geopolitical landscape and you look at the next one year to five years, what is the single thing that would provide the biggest, pose the biggest risk to global economic growth amongst the things we talked about and maybe something we haven't talked about? Um, firstly, I would say if, if you look at the price of oil and you plot that over global GDP, you can see very quickly the extent to which $100 oil can quickly prompt and catalyze a global recession. Um, so that's, I think, the first thing that we would be focused on is as the conflict in the Middle East becomes more deeply entrenched um, with perhaps not a, a clear end in sight, an end game in sight, I think that's number one. Number two is the extent to which the tension between the United States and China is driving a fragmentation of global supply chain activity. So that's actually you know, moving a lot of exporters and manufacturers to, to move from that just in time to just, or just in case to just in time mentality. Um, so that's also driving up pricing. I would say that <clears throat> the extent to which that also is creating opportunities is one to consider. Uh, so the extent to which the diversion of capital from mainland China into India, into emerging Asia, a lot of investors seeking EM exposure ex-China, I think it will create opportunities. I'd also say that the energy transition is creating opportunities, uh, you know, from the unit of carbon all the way down to the renewable sp space. And so I think, you know, we look at some of the cohesion of different actors around creating uh, corridors and, and mineral supply chains, I think will be interesting. And for viewers who are listening right now, Alexis investors looking for other ideas too, one big theme you say to focus on looking ahead is longer lifespans. What does that mean exactly, Alexis? How do you invest in longer lifespans? It means different things in different geographies. So in the US, I would say that we're very much um, accelerated down the longevity spectrum where you have people going for blood transfusions, et cetera. Um, but I would say that while our healthcare system remains deeply broken, you still see U.S. consumers pivoting and spending more out of pocket um, on alternative forms of medicine. So I would say that's one thing. In Europe, this could be medical tourism, just given France is you know, the most visited country in the world. The medical tourism space there is probably undersaturated. It's heavily fragmented. I would also say look at wealth management in Japan. Right? The yield on Japanese bonds, not necessarily very attractive. And so if I'm thinking about supporting you know, household wealth creation for pensioners in Japan, I think that's also an opportunity. Interesting. Um, another reason to go to France, I guess. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks so much. Good to see you after a long absence. Um, coming up, Microsoft set to unveil its future plans for Xbox later this week. We're going to speak to a gaming analyst on the other side about what to expect. Stay tuned.
Microsoft is going to talk about its vision for the future of Xbox at an event later this week. This coming as the gaming industry at large reported laid off more than 11,000 workers last year, and another 6,000 already this year. For more on the gaming industry landscape, we're talking to Lightshed Partners Media and Technology Analyst Brandon Ross. Brandon, it is great to have you on the show. And I thought, Brandon, you know what, let's start out kind of a a high level, Brandon, get your take on the gaming industry. You know, you, during the pandemic, of course, so many people were at home. You saw this boom, of course, of interest in gaming, Brandon. Post-pandemic, as we sit here, Brandon, now in February 2024, give us your take on just the health of the gaming industry, Brandon. How healthy is it, and, and where's the growth right now in terms of the verticals and, and kind of subsectors? Sure. Um, uh, you just referenced the pandemic and there was an obvious pull forward in growth that occurred because everyone was at home, had nothing to do. And a great way to socialize and interact with others was by playing games. So you got a little bit of a pull forward there. Since that time, growth has been, you know, pretty meager. Um, I think if you look at the Kager at a 20, it's a uh, you know, low single digits um, of growth. So part of it, it has to do with the pandemic, but then there were actually other headwinds that um, hit the industry. A big one was actually in mobile games where the IDFA changes by Apple happened and it made it much harder for um, mobile publishers to acquire users and reactivate users. And I think the industry is still struggling with that. Hey, Brandon, it's Julie here. So when we look at the number of layoffs this year, which is already trending, according to Industry Watchers, around 6,000. So at this pace, would actually surpass what we saw in uh, in 2023. What is, so that seems to reflect some of these changing dynamics that you're talking about. A lot of other big tech industries have cut their way towards back into investors' good graces and back into efficiency. Is that going to work for the gaming industry? Look. Um, it never helps to cut when you kind of get into a situation when you start cutting and you're a content and creative focused industry where you might be, you know, robbing for, from the future in order to make profitability um, strong now. However, I there's if you look at it, the gaming industry now, it's really just... Um, it's it's pretty top heavy overall out sort of outside of the quote metaverse platforms and i think you're seeing a lot of growth out of projects that were probably or headcount come out of projects that probably weren't going to be that um effective anyway so i think just like the tech companies are all of the game publishers especially in a flat growth environment are looking to take investment dollars away from the future. And Brandon, we, we also, listen, we, we think, expect Microsoft to talk about the vision, it's kind of vision of the future of Xbox later this week. Brandon, what, what are your thoughts? What do you expect we might hear from Microsoft? Yeah, well, there's, there's no secret that Microsoft has believed that we were gonna move to more of a no console future at some point, um, which is very convenient for them if you look at the strengths of Microsoft, they have not been a hardware company really at all. Um, their strengths are in cloud and they've built a lot of first party publishing and they've tried to leverage that that growth through acquisition, whether it be um, in Activision Blizzard or Bethesda in order to help um, push the, their um, subscription service, Xbox Game Pass. Unfortunately, Game Pass is underperformed. It only has 30 million subscribers right now. And in terms of uh, cloud connectivity to gaming, we're just not there yet. So all these first party publisher, um, publishing assets that they have, they need to make money off them. So a smart way to do that is to just open them up to switch and open them up to PlayStation. And if in the future they want to take them back exclusive as new iterations of these franchises come, they can do that. Do you think they're going to do that, Brandon? Do you think they're going to open them up? I mean, presumably that's probably not that's, what this, I, it, do you think that's what this big announcement is? It, it, it seems to be going that way, yes. Mm. Um, there has been a bunch of leaks about um, 
different games um, that are coming that would have been Xbox exclusives that look like they're going to show up on PlayStation as well, including Indiana Jones and others. So I think that is one thing you're going to hear about. And then the rest is this continued push towards subscription and streaming. But that seems like a dated proposition to get to massive enough scale to really have impact on the way games are distributed. So so Nadella, Brenna, has has made this big bet then really on the future of subscriptions and cloud gaming. But you're saying cloud gaming technically isn't really there yet. How long before it it is there, Brenna? Is this a matter of quarters or years? I don't know if it's if it's a technical issue. Um, at least in the United States, as much as it is an adoption issue, especially when we're, you know, pretty early on on a a new console cycle. Um, You saw, for for whatever reason, Google went at it with Stadia, never really got much traction in in cloud. xCloud hasn't had that much traction for Microsoft. So I I think, at least in the U.S., it's an adoption issue. And... The, the cloud solution just isn't that much better or really not better at all than, um, uh, than a console solution. Now in markets where people can't afford consoles and only play mobile games, then a cloud solution that could connect any screen to console quality gaming, to real AAA gaming, is something that's very interesting, but in those markets, you don't have the cloud infrastructure yet that you have um, in the United States. Brandon, before we let you go, while we have you here, we got to ask you about the Disney Epic deal that was announced, the investment that was announced last week. Um, I got to say, I ran it by my kids, uh, one of whom was playing some Fortnite, but now he's back on the Roblox train, so he was kind of like not that excited about it, but what do you make of it? Um, look, the it, you've just brought up Roblox. Roblox is ex- still experiencing 20% engagement growth, 20% user growth, 20% bookings growth, um, even out of the pandemic, where the whole industry at large has flattened out. Younger generations like to hang out in 3D interactive worlds, whether that is in Roblox, which is much more UGC, or in Fortnite. Um, which, as, as you know um, from your kids, is is more of a shooter. Um, I, I think that the ambition here is to use Disney's IP to approximate something that's closer to the behavior that you see in Roblox um, or on the um, uh, Fortnite 2.0, which is the more UGC uh, uh, type version of Fortnite, where there's tons and tons of different experiences and they're not necessarily competitive but could just be hanging out in digital space brandon it was so great to have you on the show today thanks so much for taking the time to join us thanks it was great to see you take care coming up we're going around the horn and checking in on some of today's top trending stories ali pras and josh are out on the newsroom floor with what to watch might be over and so are the days of being able to watch the big game on just one channel. We'll break down the future of Super Bowl streaming and which tech giant could be getting the game in a few years. Speaking of that big game, two and a half million people bet on the Super Bowl yesterday and that was just on one platform. We're going to dig into what the big game meant for the sports books. And while love was in the air post game for Travis and Taylor, it's the newest dating app that caught my eye today. We'll discuss how a higher credit score This might help you find that special someone in time for Valentine's Day. Stay tuned for more Yahoo Finance after the break.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Alexander Canal here with Josh Schaefer and Proud Supermanian. And to kick us off today, no pun intended, I want to talk NFL because although football season may be over, a lot has changed for the consumer and the overall viewing experience because, guys, gone are the days where you could just watch one game on one channel. Now there's a smorgasbord of options. You have games on all the cable channels, but you have some exclusive streaming partnerships this year. If you wanted to watch one of the NFL playoff games, that was exclusively on Peacock. Amazon recently acquired those rights for next year. Speaking of Amazon, they have Thursday Night Football. If you're out of your home market, you need to pay for Sunday ticket. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more on the consumer when it comes to watching the NFL. And I wonder what that's going to mean in the future. And when you think about renegotiating, renegotiating future deals, what streamers, what companies can come out on top and whether or not consumers are going to pay up. We also have the WBD, ESPN, joint partnership. To me, the biggest thing I'm curious about, and this just gets into, I think we're getting into sports calendar slowing down now, right? Like it's February, NFL just ended, we're gonna have March Madness in about a month, which is pretty big viewership wise, but overall, we're coming into the slower months. What are these companies gonna launch that keeps me on the streaming service? Because you mentioned all these different services, yeah, and I now have to get five streaming services to watch NFL football. Well, some fans are just gonna cancel them come February, right? And you're not gonna re-sign up for them until August. So it seems right, like a big, mo a big moment for content and original content to be able to push that mm -hmm. to me. If I did get Amazon Prime just to watch a couple NFL games, what's gonna keep me there? I mean, I think that's, that's the big question you asked and I think that's the answer is NFL, right? Because I mean, having Thursday Night Football is a f fantastic thing for Prime. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I'll tune in once a week at least for, to Prime to watch that. And then getting that playoff game what a huge deal. We saw the numbers for the Peacock game, and yeah. I know there was some frustration with fans talking about how they, they have to get Peacock, they don't have it, they have, to, they have to sign up for it, but they get to watch the game, and that's sort of the big thing for Amazon, is like, how do you get people to stick to the service? And they paid $11 billion for 11 years of Thursday Night Football. Thursday Night Football? I mean, getting that getting that, that playoff game, I think, is a nice little cherry on top for them, a little, 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 little uh, bone from the NFL can, you know, to, to keep them happy. Did you guys check out the Nickelodeon broadcast last night? I tuned in for a little bit. Yeah. It was pretty cool. That's fun. Yeah, I, I think it's a involved. fun, well, it's another fun way that I think we'll see more streamers try and do that, right? You think about Paramount having that access to a major brand like Nickelodeon, create something different with it and sort of push, get more out of the rights, I guess is my point. When you're going to pay right. that much for them, right. get another piece of content out of it, maybe it attracts a so different audience. Nickelodeon's Warner's? The, there was a Nickelodeon version. Right, but is it Warner? Oh, my Warner? Uh, no, Paramount. 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 Yeah. Paramount. Right, right. Uh, but so it was in joint with CBS. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got but it. what's the stickiest type of content? Sports and kids content. So it sort of makes perfect sense. I mean, parents are going to pay to keep their kids happy. Yeah. And then sports, like you were saying, yeah. that's going to get people. It was pretty I mean, funny. Patrick that. Starr was like, making fun of the athletes a little bit in SpongeBob. I, <laughs> wow, I enjoyed so it. So you watched for like kind yeah, of you know, a, I a while. while. Yeah. Nate Burleson's okay. huge star. Yeah. Huge star. Oh, and, yeah. and shout out to uh, Noah Eagle doing the broadcast. It was great. Oh, yeah? Yeah, 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 of course. But we'll have to get Patrick Starr with us, guys. That's my goal for this okay, segment. Okay, I'll be a group I need Patrick Starr making fun of me <laughs> as we break down a little bit of betting, right? So moving on from Amazon that's making that big bet uh, on the NFL. So did 2.5 million people who gambled on FanDuel alone. FanDuel telling us that 14 million wagers were placed last night with a total handle reaching over 307 million dollars but guys one of the key takeaways from last night was the house wasn't necessarily the biggest winner so we had the kansas city chiefs obviously coming out on top the kansas city chiefs were not favored to win the game so they had longer odds so the books are paying out more for the chiefs winning the majority of the money was on the chiefs at most sports books mm -hmm. and then you also had that game go to overtime well the bet for the total points scored was 47 just about maybe 46 and a half depending on when you got it and that's where the game ended was 47 so a lot of the bets started cashing as we got into overtime interesting stack coming out of Macquarie uh, Chad Bynon over there doing some great research on the gambling stock saying he thinks the hold rate so what the companies take away the casinos take away was minus four percent so they likely came away actually probably losing money last night but it could still be a giant customer acquisition moment and still be positive overall for the stocks he wrote, which is interesting. You know, I, I love talking about this industry. Once, a once opaque, illegal industry that we couldn't ever really talk about. Now we have numbers, we have real businesses kind of going into this. And you mentioned that, that whole overtime thing. I mean, just talking about, I think ESPN talking about BetMGM was, was having a hard time with all those overs being hit in, the, in overtime. Not just like you said, the 
um, the, the, the player People props, player players props players too, right? as well sure. as the, the game over. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a tough night for them. But again, it's a great night for, for, for sports betting and how many new customers we're seeing, how easy it is to, mm -hmm. to bet on your app and how easy it is to create your own parlay and all these different things and learning about what the hell a parlay is. I mean, this is all bullish for that industry. I think it's just all a big wins for FanDuel, DraftKings, et cetera, BetMGM, whoever can operate and the largest scale online, I think is just going to be bananas for them for the next 10 years or so. And like you're saying, Josh, customer acquisition. If you win a big bet, you're probably going to bet again. You want people to win last You night. want people to if win. If you have people betting for the first time, you want them to win, right? And, and the sports books had a really solid January, so likely this won't affect mm -hmm. them too much financially. So. Yeah. We need Pros to pick a better parlay for us next time. I know. I owe Pros five bucks. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, Ali and our, our legs worked, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, my speaking of that, now from scoring on the field to scoring off the field with your credit score, Travis Kelty touted a good credit score in his ad campaign with Credit Bureau Experian, but I'm guessing the future Hall of Famer didn't need to produce his FICO score for courting Taylor Swift. But a new dating app is out here focusing on singles with excellent credit. It's called Score. And you need at least a 675 credit score to use it. That's kind of low in my opinion, but who am I to say that? But yeah, what do you guys <laughs> say? Are you, are you guys looking at that kind of metric for when you're dating? So apparently when you sign up for this, they don't show the score on the app, but they'll match you with, with like-minded individuals. And there's that, that right? like yeah. exclusivity factor. You know the people that are on that have at least mm -hmm. a 675 credit score. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot on the group chat about financial <laughs> infidelity, how people are uncomfortable talking about financial money. Financial infidelity. Yeah, people are hiding their oh, finances yeah, 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 from yeah. their spouses. They're not fully comfortable discussing yeah, things like a yeah. credit score. So I'm not totally against this idea. If this is something that's very important to you in a relationship, why not have an app like this and seek it out? The, the, the thing is, though, with all the apps, I just feel like there's so much saturation now. Right. And I'm just, also the quality of the, you, you just don't know. It, it seems like maybe a nice potential add-on to an app that's already out there for me. Um, yeah. Something that you can choose to click on or click off, but not necessarily a solo app, standalone app, just from, like you said, yeah. the amount of apps that people have to have, right? And people kind of gravitate towards two or three apps out there, and you're, you're introducing a whole other mm -hmm. app. Because well, you're communicating with people on the apps, too. So right. if, if you, you have five of, of them, how are you going to be, be able to figure it out? Well, right? You need, you need quantity of people. Yeah, I mean, this kind of reminds me of, I'm not going to name any names, but social clubs, right? That right. That's what you're kind of implicitly uh, kind of n noticing, it's like, well, I have. Well, th there's an app called the League out there, yeah. and that's supposed yeah. to be a higher end. But again, if right. people aren't on those apps and they're gravitating towards others, then you're not going to find your your Mr. Right. Yeah, we all can, right, we got to go work on our profile. Merge betting and dating together. Here's the way to do that. There you go. Betting, dating, we'll put it all on the profile. Streaming, <laughs> streaming, streaming, streaming. Yeah. We love stream to stream. Games. But coming up, we are going to bring you, get you set for tomorrow, and give you everything you need to know to start your Tuesday.
A big announcement from luxury automaker Aston Martin today, and Yahoo Finance's Press Romanian has the latest. What's the announcement? Yes, uh, Aston Martin unveiling three new vehicles today. Now, well, one of them was an F1 race car for the, ah. the upcoming season. Not the one AM that we're going to buy. No, the <laughs> AMR24, which I would love to drive, but not really. But uh, Aston, <laughs> Aston is targeting fifth place or higher in the overall standings for the season, which kicks off next month. Now, the team had a strong 2023, but thinks it can build off that success with an improved race car. More importantly, the British luxury band also debuted its updated Vantage sports car mm -hmm. and the Vantage GT3 race car. The road, the road going Vantage, of course, super important in the entry level sports car category where prices start around $150,000. Now, Aston had some hiccups last year production, but executive chairman Lauren Stroll says those days are behind the company especially after some successful launches. Here's what he had to say. We've never had so many launches in one back-to-back -back period of time in the company's history. And that just continues on our success of our DBX, you know, our SUV, which we launched three years ago. We've taken 20% share of the automotive luxury uh, SUV high performance market in three years, quite a feat. So carrying on from the success of DBS to DB12, on to Vantage, um, and next year we'll come with our first mid-engine hybrid program with Valhalla. But very exciting times for the company. I mean, a pretty, pretty broad range of products there uh, across the board from sports cars to ultra sports cars to SUVs. You know, speaking of that SUV, the DBX, you know, we spoke about a year ago, you mentioned to me how that was the first car under your stewardship that, that got yeah. to that really interesting luxury metric, that 40% contribution margin. I know I was really intrigued by that. And I'm curious, how is that going in terms of the business hitting that, that, those marks that you want to hit for a profitable and, and successful luxury brand? First, you have a very good memory. The DBX 707 <laughs> was the first vehicle under my stewardship that was launched with a minimum, I said, of 40% contribution margin. And I mentioned then, and it, now it holds true, that every vehicle to be launched after it, the first was DB12, second will be Vantage, will all have a 40 plus percent contribution margin. So we, we're, we're doing exactly that. You know, interesting metric to watch there. Interesting guy, Lawrence Stroll, very interesting, charismatic uh, guy who made a lot of money in the fashion industry mm -hmm. in, in Canada. But anyway, you know, he also spoke about the demand picture there with the luxury consumer. He says that they're, they're not seeing a recessionary mood from these clients. In fact, they're seeing the opposite. They're seeing considerable growth there. So it seems like stocks at all-time highs, uh, the, the possibility of rate cuts is not bad for the luxury consumer. Interesting. I mean, that's kind of along the lines of what we've been hearing from some of the, on the retail side, some mm -hmm. of the luxury companies as well. Yeah, and, this, and the Todd's group getting probably going private with El Caterham. It's just really interesting stuff happening in luxury space. There is. Well, yeah. thanks so much for bringing us that. Appreciate it. Well, let's take a look at what is trending after hours now. Avis budget shares pairing losses after the car rental company reported fourth quarter earnings. The stock initially plummeted but did gain back some ground. The companies did miss the quarter's revenue estimates by $10 million and fourth quarter profit fell by less than expected, aided by demand and cost-cutting efforts. Shares of Arista Networks are sliding after hours by almost 7.5% after a strong quarter for the networking company. It did beat on the top and bottom lines and delivered a first quarter forecast in line with the street's expectations. Uh, but the shares are falling today. Uh, perhaps uh, expectations were running a little bit higher going into the report. If you look at how the shares have done year to date, uh, they're up about 19%. And then there's Zoom Info. Those shares up 22%, zipping up on better than expected results. Zoom Info also announcing a co-pilot powered by generative AI in the release. The context for Zoom Info is also quite important. Those shares down 13% this year. They have fallen by nearly 40% over the past year. So it's the flip side of Arista that the expectations were quite low going into this report because of some recent struggles by the company. And time now for to watch Tuesday, February 13th. Earnings ramp back up ahead of the open. Coca-Cola, Marriott, and Molson Coors among the companies reporting in the morning. Investors are going to focus on whether Molson Coors gains will ease from the benefits it's seen on the back of Bud Light's backlash last year. And also after the close, we're going to hear from Airbnb and Lyft. Airbnb are gearing up to announce its earnings the fourth quarter amid potential moderation in travel demand. Shares already up more than 10% so far this year.
And continuing with the big earnings day, Shopify, MGM Resorts, Lyft, they'll report as well. Lyft's fourth quarter results coming after rival Uber topped Wall Street estimates and saw gross bookings rise 22% year over year. And taking a look at the economy, monthly consumer price index data for the month of January releasing in the morning. Markets will keep a close eye on cooling inflation as economists forecast very little change compared to December, Julie. And then just to double click here, mm. I am focusing um, in on those CPI numbers because this is the first read since the we've been getting all this Fed speak and since we heard from Jay Powell himself, the first read on inflation since the market is coming to terms mm -hmm. with the Fed pushing back its pace of, of rate, in, uh, rate cuts. Uh, interesting note on this point from the Bank of America economics team today where they say, you know, when the Fed says we want more good data to confirm what we've been seeing, they suggest it's not just the headline number, it's not just the core number, it's the composition of the number that's going to be really important. In other words, you got to separate goods inflation, shelter inflation, and also services, how all of that is looking the Fed's going to be focusing in on that to try to figure out what happens next. All right, you're watching CPI. I'm going to look at Airbnb reporting Q4 results tomorrow. By the way, the stock just hit a 52-week yeah. high in today's trade. It's up 13% already this year. Um, analysts, I will tell you, Julie, looking over, not in love with it. Most have a hold. The average price target, about 138. And as we sit here right now, stock's at nearly 154. So that tells you where the analysts are at. We did just hear from Expedia. Remember, we broke right. that on our yep. kind of mixed results mm -hmm. there. Though analysts who cover the space say, actually, there should only be a minimally negative read-through from that print to this one, in their opinion. So the report, we'll see. Yeah, Airbnb has been trying to offer some new services, tweak things. Mm -hmm. We'll see if it's working. Okay. Yes, we will. All right, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. And folks, if you are in the New York area or the Northeast, be careful tonight. Get home safe.